In the last lecture, uh, we saw Rubens uh, painting a story from Greek mythology, as told in Roman times, a story about illicit love, illicit affair that went against nature in a stoic way of thinking and was punished by nature itself. Now, Rubens had traveled to Rome, like every artist that we've considered so far, to learn from its ancient and modern wonders and to be changed by them. This week we're going to look at a picture by another artist from north of the Alps, Gavin Hamilton, a Scot, uh, who came to Rome to study 150 years after Rubens did. But he stayed on to paint subjects from Greek and Roman literature. Before I say more, uh, uh, let's just spend a minute or so uh, looking at the picture. We see people represented a little over life size, <coughs> filling the picture. In the center, a muscular man in armor steps forward, looking upward, clen uh, clenching a dagger, and flinging up an arm. Holding onto his cloak uh, is a young woman who has one breast bared to reveal a stab wound. Her eyes are half closed. There's blood on the stone floor uh, next to a scabbard. She's being supported by a man who covers his face with his cloak in grief or possibly in shame. The man at the center holds the dagger point up, and we can see that it's bloody. His arm is being held up by the older bearded man next to him. And he points one finger at the bloody dagger. The third man puts one hand to his heart and with the other hand holds a short sword uh, in a sheath. All three men stride forward over a pile of armor on the floor, a helmet and a spear we see that the figures are arranged in two groups, the wounded woman and the grieving man on the left and the three excited men on the right. Separate groups, but linked by the woman's arm and her gesture of seizing the cloak exactly in the midline of the composition. The light in the room is dim, but in the background we can actually see a young person raising the curtain and looking in with a gesture of surprise. <coughs> and we can see two thick columns and some green curtains, and that's all. I think you don't need to know who's who <coughs> to make sense of what's going on here. The artist has made that emphatically clear. <coughs> a dying woman is appealing to armed men who are looking towards heaven. What we have is one of the key episodes in the history of early Rome. The artist and his audience would have read, in it, <coughs> read it in uh, Livy's account, uh, written in the time of the Emperor Augustus. Now, Livy tells his readers that he emphasizes not only what happened to, the, to their, their ancestors, but particularly the morals to be drawn from the events. So that, to quote him, the record you can find for yourself and your country you may <coughs> start again. In that record, you can find for yourself and your country both examples to follow and warnings. Livy tells how for 25 years, Rome was ruled by its last king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, Superbus the Proud, who was increasingly oppressive to the people and to his nobles. One of those nobles, a, a talented nephew of the king called Lucius Juni Junius, was afraid of being assassinated and faked being stupid, for which he got the nickname Brutus, or Dimwit. Another nobleman, Colatinus, had a wife, Lucretia, who was beautiful and especially virtuous. One of the king's sons, Sextus Tarquinius, who was deceitful, vicious, was smitten by Lucretia, and while he was a guest in her house, he came to her bedroom late at night and threatened her with a knife. 
Either she would submit to him or he would kill her and the slave and put their bodies in bed together. Then he'd say he'd surprised them. And this would be to her everlasting disgrace and that of her family. She submits to rape. And afterwards she tells her father what happened and gets him to summon the husband, Colatinus, and Brutus, and another friend. And they gather. Lucretia says to them, and now I'm reading from Livy again, but pledge me your solemn word that the adulterer shall not go unpunished. It is Sextus Tarquin who, coming as an enemy instead of as a guest, forced me last night by brutal violence, a pleasure fatal to me, and if you are men, fatal to him. So they all successively pledged their word, and they tried to console the distracted woman by turning the guilt from the victim <clears throat> they by turning the guilt from the victim of the outrage to the perpetrator and urging her that it is the mind that sins, not the body, and where there has been no consent, there is no guilt. It is for you, she said, to see that he gets his deserts. Although I acquit myself of the sin, I do not free myself from the penalty. No unchaste woman shall henceforth live and, pre and plead Lucretia's example. She had a knife concealed in her dress, which she plunged into her heart and fell dying to the floor. Her father and husband raised the death cry, again from Ovid, from, uh, Lucretia, from uh, <clears throat> Livy. Whilst they were absorbed in grief, Brutus drew the knife from Lucretia's wound and holding it, dripping with blood in front of him, said, by this blood, most pure before the outrage, wrought by the king's son, I swear, I swear to you, O gods, I call to witness that I will drive hence Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, together with his cursed wife and his whole brood, with fire and sword and every means in my power, and I will not suffer them or anyone else to reign in Rome. Then he handed the knife to Colatinus, and then to Lucretius, the father, and then to Valerius, who were all astounded at the marvel of the thing, wondering whence Brutus had acquired this new character. They swore as they were directed. All their grief changed to wrath, and they followed the lead of Brutus, who summoned them to abolish the monarchy forthwith. Brutus, who's revealed uh, he's not a dimwit, but a leader, then brings her body uh, to the Roman Forum, gives a speech, recruits volunteers, captures Rome, exiles the Tarquins, and then together with Lucretia's widower, Colatinus, Brutus is elected consul. The new republic is born. Livy begins his next chapter this way. It is of a Rome henceforth free that I write the history. So just quickly to summarize, uh, a tyrant rises to kingship, brutalizing the nobles and scorning the Senate. His son threatens a virtuous married woman with rape, and she submits in order to spare herself and her family the greater dishonor of being murdered in a compromising situation. She kills herself so that unchaste women in the future won't be tempted to use her survival as an example. She asks to be avenged, and she is, by a revolution, the end of kingship and the beginning of a republic ruled by representatives of the people. Well, why this story, and why at this moment, uh, in the 1760s, by a Scottish painter living in Rome? To begin with, let's look at the artist Gavin Hamilton was a versatile man. He was born into a Scottish noble family, had a university education, and found his life's work in Italy as an artist, as a student of Greek and Roman art, an excavator, a dealer, a host to countless travelers to Rome, British and otherwise, and a guide and a mentor to younger artists. 
For many visitors, Hamilton's studio was one of the attractions of Rome. After his studies at Glasgow University, Hamilton did in 1748 what well-to-do Scots and Irish and English young men had been doing for more and more and often for the past 30 years. He traveled to Italy, and apart from a few short returns home and trips all over Italy, Hamilton remained in Rome until he died in 1798. His teacher was Agostino Mazzucci, uh, the leading history painter, who taught him the basic techniques of composing figure paintings and taking a mild, colorful, anecdotal approach to his subjects with lots to look at, which Hamilton soon got far beyond. Hamilton had read Roman history and literature at school and in the university, but his life was changed by encountering actual Greek and Roman statues. More and more material was coming to light around Rome and Naples. It was only a century earlier that marble was still being stripped from ancient Roman buildings and being burnt for lime. And the Roman Forum, uh, the greatest public space perhaps ever created, had gotten the nickname Campo Vaccino, cow pasture. And it was still being used for grazing, as you see it here in this painting by a Dutch artist. And um, in Hamilton's time, though, it, it was cleared, but only partly. It wasn't just uh, statues that were being recovered, but also entire buried cities. This was Herculaneum and Pompeii uh, that were rediscovered not long before he arrived. And the King of Naples founded a museum for new finds that kept coming to light. There were houses with acres of vivid wall paintings. These two sites helped to create a far richer picture of city life and domestic surroundings than had ever been seen. And the popes had been conducting excavations uh, on their own vast land holdings and also buying material found elsewhere in order to put it in the Vatican as well as in their new museum on the Capitoline. Hamilton met the first scholar to lay out the history and development of ancient art in a systematic way, the German-born librarian at the Vatican, Johann Winkelmann. Winkelmann not only responded to the beauty of ancient sculpture, but he believed that that beauty was more than physical, it was moral. He argued that society should return to the values of the ancient Greeks which he saw expressed in their sculpture. He wrote that for art as well as for society, and I'm quoting him, the only way to become great, if indeed it were possible to become inimitable, is to imitate the ancients. Winkelmann believed that Greek art was based on freedom of thought, which made possible participatory government. These ideas became essential beliefs of the Enlightenment, and they shaped political and educational reforms all over Europe, as well as in the British colonies, like ours. And thanks partly to Winkelmann, Rome in the 18th century was a kind of secular shrine for people of all interests, not strictly artistic. Well, Hamilton came to Rome in the footsteps of countless well-born young men from the British Isles, and from many countries on the continent. Hamilton was on the Grand Tour. This was an educational voyage lasting a year or two or three, taken at the end of your formal education, usually in the company of your tutor and frequently of your servants. Uh, the British were the most numerous, the most visible of these tourists, but not the only ones. Starting in the early 1700s, when at last there was no more war going on in Europe, the numbers of tourists grew annually until it stopped during Napoleon's invasion of Italy in the 1790s. The Grand Tour has been called a peaceful British invasion and also an honors course in culture and certainly a rite of passage into adulthood. It certainly functioned as a kind of finishing school for manners since you moved among sophisticated foreigners and travelers of your own or higher class. You could come by sea, but most people had the adventure of coming over the Alps, which got easier over the years, but it still has its hazards. 
Travelers described horrible carriages and worse inns, thieves, dreadful food, bedbugs, and lice. In some order or other, you came through France, went to Venice, Florence, Naples, and Rome. And if you had extra months or years, you went to other cities too. But Rome was by tradition the goal, where you stayed the longest. You'd had some kind of classical education in school, and you were assumed, sometimes wrongly, to have an interest in what you were seeing. <laughs> Edward Gibbon, the future historian of the Roman Empire, did have an interest. He wrote, I can never forget nor express the strong emotions which agitated my mind as I first approached and entered the eternal city. After a sleepless night, I trod with lofty step the ruins of the Forum, each memorable spot where Romulus stood, or Cicero spoke, or Caesar fell. Each spot was at once present to my eye, and several days of intoxication were lost or enjoyed before I could descend to a cool and minute investigation. <clears throat> well, this good-looking grand tourist in the center of Gavin Hamilton's portrait <clears throat> is his kinsman, Douglas Hamilton, the 21-year-old premier duke in Scotland. You see him uh, with his uh, tutor here, he's pointing out the sights, and the tutor's son, uh, who's admiring the duke instead, <clears throat> before setting out, the duke wrote uh, piously <clears throat> and a bit uh, double negatively, the duke wrote, <clears throat> I have not read the Roman classics with so little feeling as not to wish to view the country they describe and where they were written. In fact, historians report that during his three-year stay in Rome, he was a lot more interested in girls, clothes, and horses than he was in ancient Rome. <clears throat> the Duke wasn't alone in taking advantage of being away from the cold, foggy north and out of the sight of his parents. The tutor, or governor, was supposed to be a chaperone and he didn't always have an easy time of it. Governors uh, got the nickname bear leaders uh, from street entertainers who lead tame bears around. And this print shows a, a grand tourist as a cub, all dressed up, but like a dumb little beast held by the hand by his cranky looking governor. <clears throat> the portrait by Batoni on the right uh, shows another Scot of important clan, Thomas Dundas, who at the end of his grand tour clearly wanted to be remembered as a man of classical culture. He'd seen the Apollo Belvedere, he'd seen the Laocoon, he'd seen the Cleopatra, and all in different places in the Vatican, which the artist Batoni grouped together uh, for his portrait. When you set off on your own grand tour, you probably had mental pictures of a lot that you were going to see, which you formed from paintings or prints like these, uh, made by Italians who specialized in views made for the tourist trade. The grandest of these were the imaginary gallery views of Panini, uh, which you could see in great houses, with each ancient building in a frame, as though you had collected each one of them uh, on your grand tour. The same with buildings uh, and statues of modern Rome. The ones that Panini chose to show in the painting helped to fix the tourist's itinerary. These were the sites that you needed to see. You got a preview and you inflated your in expectations. Oh, this is, by the way, um, uh, one of Panini's uh, imaginary views uh, that's here in the gallery. Uh, you see the forum with buildings rearranged to let us see more, uh, and some sculptures moved there uh, by the painter's imagination from other locations. And tourists are wandering through, and there's a man in a toga, and peasants uh, dressed up uh, in shepherd's uh, costumes, um, which um, are sort of ar lend an Arcadian air to all of this, suggesting that, that antiquity survives uh, even in the habits of modern Romans. You got a preview from these pictures and you, as I said, inflated your expectations. These big engravings by Piranesi came back in the luggage of generations of tourists 
and they suggested to the next generations what to see and how to respond with wonder at the grandeur of what these ruins once were and are no more. You might go to Venice too, preferably at carnival time when you wore a mask and you could get away with anything, uh, where nobody was digging up statues and where you hardly had to walk anywhere. You could just lean back in your gondola. Uh, the Feast of the Ascension gave you the best spectacle of all here uh, with uh, the gilded galley of the Doge emerging once a year for the marriage of the sea. In any case, you might well buy a souvenir like this, painting by Canaletto, a painting by to go with your panini back home. In Naples, and in the region, uh, there was a lot to see. <clears throat> Not only the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum, but also the volcano that had buried them in 79 AD and still upstaged them sometimes, especially in the 1760s and again in 1779 when Vesuvius put on a show of such wondrous eruptions that they were a kind of gift to tourists and to painters alike. <coughs> and on the other side of Naples, uh, there was that strange uh, region of uh, sort of fire belching fields, a kind of vision of hell on earth uh, that was on a, everybody's must see list. At the archaeological sites, there was entertainment. You could be shown a Roman house uh, here being excavated in Herculaneum, and the guide would tell you just for you, he'd open a door. It had never been opened since antiquity. And again, amazing, there was a skeleton. <laughs> you could buy things too, which grand tourists did. Um, that's what's going on here in this drawing where supposedly genuine antiquities are coming right out of that ruined house uh, uh, to, uh, to a kind of sales counter uh, at the site. Uh, the Brit British writer Edward Clark said about Rome, it had been for so long been exhausted of every valuable relic that it became necessary to institute a manufactory for the fabrication of such rubbish as half the English nation came in search of every year. <laughs> Hamilton himself led trips uh, to actual excavations of his own. Uh, here he's got a crowd uh, of well-dressed people, you can see him here, uh, well-dressed people at Gabii, which is a Roman city that he discovered which, by the way, figures in Livy's history of Tarquin the Proud, and I can easily imagine Hamilton reading bits aloud to his audience. From time to time, Hamilton himself uh, would serve as a guide for the more serious sorts of grand tourists. Very few people knew the collections as well as he did or could talk as expertly to the finer points of painting and sculpture. He could point out falsifications, and particularly restorations, just as another man is doing here. On the left, uh, extensive restorations were the norm in ancient statues, which were almost always found broken, sometimes dismembered, and usually headless. Uh, Hamilton knew that because he was in the trade himself. Many grand tourists would have rather would <coughs> have gladly gone farther east to Greece, but the Turks still ruled Greece, and it would be that way for another 60 years. A few intrepid Brits went to the Middle East, however, and these two Scots uh, in the painting had the fantastic good luck of coming upon the ruins of the Roman city of Palmyra in the middle of the Syrian desert. In 1752, uh, Gavin Hamilton painted their portraits and gave them the honor of putting them in togas, which is doubtful that they were wearing at the time. I want to look for a moment at the commercial side of Hamilton's antiquarian activities, his digging and dealing. Uh, when he wasn't painting, Hamilton was one of the most productive of the many excavators in Italy. I, I'd call them archaeologists, but that implies something else, a systematic, patient, uh, documented process that wasn't yet in use by our, anybody. The goal was not reconstructing history, but recovering works of art. Hamilton knew a good thing when he found it. And he knew uh, what it was, uh, thanks to his studies of the whole history of sculpture. And he had a ready market. It was not only wealthy British travelers and collectors with large houses that he sold to, like his greatest buyer, uh, Charles Townley, but also the Pope, who was collecting for the Capitoline Museum. 
Hamilton was no tomb robber. Uh, he had a good reputation for respecting property rights, and he got permission to dig on papal lands and make agreements with landowners to share what he found. Where the annoying business of getting permission to export pieces was concerned, however, um, he was known to cut corners. What he found was often perfectly marvelous. To give you some idea, Hamilton dug at Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli and at least five other sites, including Ostia and Gabii, and their finds went to at least nine great collectors, including the Pope and including the collector Henry Blundell, who built the Garden Temple uh, for them near Liverpool, his own reduced version of the Pantheon. Um, <coughs> here again, um, oh yeah, hang on a second, here is um, Townley's study <coughs> at Park Street with some of the major pieces from his 300-odd sculptures, which became the core of the collection of the British Museum. At one point, Hamilton wrote this bit of encouragement to his client, uh, Townley. In spite of the sneers of a tasteless age, uh, wrote Hamilton, never forget that the most valuable acquisition that a man of refined taste can make is a piece of fine Greek sculpture. That would have included the Venus of the Medici type that Hamilton excavated at Ostia in 1776, and for a long time was considered one of the greatest works of Greek sculpture. Like most other statues dug up in Italy that were then thought to be Greek, and Hamilton sold in good faith, this one is really a very good ancient Roman copy of a Greek original. Many of Hamilton's finds are now prizes in major museums. Hamilton was also a picture dealer. Most of his clients for antique sculpture were also bought paintings, and Hamilton had a trained eye. Most of Italy in the 18th century was a kind of mine uh, for pictures. A couple of examples, both sold to Englishmen, both now in the National Gallery in London, by Raphael, uh, sold by Hamilton to Lord Spencer, and Leonardo da Vinci, sold by Hamilton's heirs, heirs to uh, Lord Lansdowne. Hamilton took requests from his good clients, like Lord Spencer, and went out looking, apparently traveling a great deal, using various scouts and agents, writing clients uh, the letters that would keep their juices flowing. Uh, to give you the flavor, here's what he wrote in January 1766 to Lord Spencer, the young man you see on the left. Uh, I'm going to illustrate the letter as we go. A lot of this concerns a hunt for pictures by the most sought-after painter of the preceding century, Guido Reni. I have the honor of your lordship's letter of the 20th of December, by which I find you are still desirous of the Barberini Magdalene by Guido Reni. It is certainly a most capital picture, considering the master, the subject, and preservation. Nevertheless, I think the price high, and should willingly try every means of getting some other good picture before I make them a second offer of the 4,000 crowns and leave it for the last shift. I've made an offer for the famous picture of Guido in the Giustiniani Palace, which is exactly the size you want, but with no better success. The nuns of San Ambrogio have a good picture of Pietro da Cortona, but they won't part with it. I've likewise spoken with the friars of the Chiesa Nuova about the fine picture by Baroccio, representing the visitation of the Virgin, but unluckily they happen to be the only disinterested friars in Rome and not tempted by money. <laughs> and, and so it goes on and on. Dealing was lucrative, but it was a lot of work. Well now. After this little uh, grand tour of our own, I'm going to return to Hamilton as a painter. <coughs> Hamilton's most ambitious project, what he called his great plan of life, uh, was a series of six pictures with subjects from the Iliad of Homer. They began uh, in 1760 with these drawings, now in the British Art Center, in preparation for two large paintings. The subjects are similar, lamentations of the deaths of warriors on both sides of the war. Achilles mourns his companion, 
Patroclus on the left, who he'd sent out wearing his own armor and who was killed by the Trojan hero Hector. And on the right, Andromache with the body of Hector, her husband, dead at the hand of Achilles. We have uh, one of these paintings, which makes it obvious that Hamilton didn't just make all this up on his own. He had studied paintings by Nicolas Poussin and his successor, uh, Charles Lebrun, uh, such as this one in Versailles by Lebrun, uh, which has tall, willowy figures uh, organized into a shallow frieze in front of a tent, expressing grief with solemn intensity. It's with this image, though, Andromache bewailing the death of Hector, that Hamilton reaches a new level of seriousness and monumentality. The painting here, uh, for which you only see a print, the painting was destroyed, but this engraved reproduction that Hamilton had made by Domenico Cunego uh, was one of a set uh, of the whole series um, of six. This series could be bought by collectors who couldn't come to Rome or couldn't afford a painting by Hamilton. His prices for paintings were very high. The picture must have struck people as something quite new. It is a tremendously grave and dignified lamentation of a hero with noble gestures, but nothing excessive. And there's not a tear shed, even by the widow Andromache. There's no self-indulgence, but instead self-mastery. Johann Winkelmann's description of Greek sculpture fits this picture. It has noble simplicity and calm grandeur in gesture and expression. Hamilton's audience knew that in this picture he was quoting the supreme master of classical subjects, Nicolas Poussin, a century earlier. For the setting, Hamilton has turned to the deathbed scene of the General Germanicus at the top right. More about him uh, in the next lecture. And for certain figures to Poussin's sacrament of extreme unction. Hamilton's picture has various items of furniture that were based on archaeological evidence, but of course they're mostly Imperial Roman and they're total anachronisms, having nothing to do with prehistoric Rome, uh, Troy, uh, a thousand years earlier. I show you several more of these Iliad scenes as transcribed by the engraver, not just because of the skill of both artists, but also because of their harsh seriousness and the way it introduces us to the language of the painting of Lucretia we're talking about here. Uh, having killed the Trojan hero, Achilles is about to drag the corpse around the walls of Troy. Under the rules of war, this is a terrible desecration, and it's a display of the excessive fury of Achilles, the famous rage that's the theme of the entire epic. Hamilton adapted his Achilles from a colossal figure every visitor to Rome knew, one of the horse tamers, so-called, uh, on the Quirinal. The other print shows a scene near the end of the Iliad when Hector's aged father, King Priam, begs Achilles to have pity and return the corpse of his son for a proper burial, saying, I put my lips to the hand of the one who killed my son. Achilles was so moved and that the two wept together over the memory of the men who died on both sides. The composition here is less crowded than before, the gestures more coordinated and emphatic. Critics who saw the Iliad paintings praised them for their emotional power. The French painter Natoire wrote that they moved the spectator to horror and compassion. These are words borrowed from the poetics of Aristotle, who wrote that the purpose of tragedy is to arouse pity and fear. At one point, Hamilton himself refers to the 
sublime ideas of the incomparable Homer. Well, we've entered a period when the qualities of calm and balance and restraint, components of what the 18th century defined as beauty, were getting competition from the other qualities, the opposite qualities that belong to what was defined as sublime. Sublime not meaning with, with present day meaning of super great, but meaning awe-inspiring, dangerous, irrational, scary. We're on the edge of full-blown romantic taste here in art and literature, which reveled in the sublime. And Homer and Homer's epics were raw enough and remote enough in time to make him a hero in the Romantic Age. Hamilton's painting of Lucretia's suicide and the oath to avenge it was his most influential work. Before I come back to the painting, I'm showing you the engraving so that you can see how concentrated it is compared to the Homer paintings I've been showing you just a few years earlier. I also want to make the point that this engraving was all we knew about what Hamilton's painting looked like until about 50 years ago. The painting itself had belonged to the family of a man, the man who commissioned it in Rome in 1763, Charles, Lord Hope. It wasn't finished until 1767 and was, was delivered the following year after Hope's premature death to this place, to the family house uh, in Scotland, Hopeton House, uh, the greatest house in Scotland, just outside Edinburgh in, in sight, as you can see in the picture on the top, of the Fourth Bridges. At some time during the next 150 years, the painting got somewhere out of sight in the house. Um, <laughs> and in the meantime, another version by Hamilton himself, same size and very similar, had been hiding in plain sight in an unlikely place on the main stairs of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane at Covent Garden, <laughs> where countless people have passed it on their way to the producers or the Lion King. It was fully published, this picture from Drury Lane was fully published in 1961, sorry, where am I? Um, in 1961 uh, as the lost first version. But six years later, the Hopeton picture reappeared somehow and was sent to auction not once but three times, failing twice to sell until the artist and the subject and the importance of the picture were recognized. And then Paul Mellon bought it. <laughs> There's a third version out there, still lost, by the way. And Hamilton wrote to an English patron about the composition that he'd managed to improve on the earlier ones. So that one we might see again eventually. But this is the most important painting by Hamilton that survives. Hamil Hamilton directs the action in such a way to tell the story with a kind of brutal graphic directness. And the choice of story was involved with the lives and the values of his audience, as I'll say in a moment. It embodies a broad shift of subjects and style in painting that began in Hamilton's time and in Rome. Subjects and style, as I've said before in these lectures, were the means. The end was a narrative with a moral purpose. So first, the subject. Lucretia had been a popular tragic heroine in art for centuries, going back to the Middle Ages, and we have many, many pictures. One great painting is uh, very unusually actually shows the whole story. Now, this is Botticelli's large panel in the Gardner Museum, painted late in his career, showing the action set in a splendid imaginary Roman city, where at the left, Tarquin is seen threatening Lucretia with a knife. At the right, she's been stabbed and she emerges with men supporting her. And in the middle panel, middle part of the picture, she's laid out, dagger still in her chest as men in armor grieve and a few raise their swords high. They aren't swearing an oath, but their gestures do say vendetta. 
Presiding ab above, from the top of the column, is David. David, a kind of cult figure for Florence, who's used his virtue and brains to triumph over Goliath, just as the men below uh, here, the men directly below him, especially this man, um, must be Brutus, uh, just as he will overcome the tyrant Tarquin. It's much less common to see the assault, but there are a few examples so dazzling that I, I need to show them. Uh, the first is Titian's late picture painted for Philip II of Spain, where the heinous act is clothed in sumptuous paint, I mean, making everything rich and vibrant and putting spectators in a kind of unfamiliar conflict between being repelled by the crime and yet pleased by the sheer skill of the choreography <coughs> and the vibrant paint surface and, and, yes, the beauty of the nude. Rubens complicates things by adding a couple of allegorical figures, and he makes Tarquin use an explicit gesture with one hand while he hides the dagger uh, with his other hand. Lucretia is so gorgeously painted that the patron must have had several motives for owning the picture <laughs> of this pr particular paragon of virtue one certainly being erotic titillation in a socially legitimate form. <laughs> Most versions show Lucretia after she has stabbed herself. Sodoma stages the scene with two men in, at hand, um, presumably her father and her husband, using a kind of smoky half-light to deepen the gravity of the act. He shows her torso down to below her midsection, which is very unusual, and only kind of notionally draped with the filmiest of cloth. The erotic intention of the picture here is pretty explicit. This actually appears to be the picture that Vasari says was painted, curiously enough, by, uh, for uh, Giovanni de' Medici on the occasion of his election as Pope, Pope, <laughs> pope Leo X. I'm, I think I will leave it at that. The German painter Cranach presents another aspect of innocence. This is Lucretia head to toe, wearing a transparent scarf and about to use the dagger. I show you this Lucretia by Guido Reni out of the dozens I could have picked because it shows Reni's formula for idealizing uh, piety and pathos, a, a formula that was admired and emulated throughout Europe and which Hamilton knew very well. You can recognize that in Hamilton here, on the right, um, the detail shows the, this formula as well as the kind of smooth surfaces and clearly outlined forms uh, that we see in Guido Reni. This Lucretia is one of the most moving ideas Rembrandt ever had. To let her be fully clothed looking away, pensive, calm, and pulling the bell cord to summon a servant. It was unusual to combine the suicide and the oath of vengeance the way Hamilton did, but one contemporary of Rembrandt did just that, and we know that Hamilton actually bought and sold one of these two pictures by Luca Giordano, the traveling Neapolitan, each quite powerful in its own forcefully lighted and some somewhat hectic way. The picture on the right, uh, seen in mirror image, might very well have suggested uh, to Hamilton how he could pose uh, Lucretia. The layout is roughly uh, similar, but the details uh, differ. Uh, Lucretia doesn't reach out. The men are passing the knife around, as, as Livy says they did, before they swear an oath. So much for the subject. <clears throat> now let me turn to Hamilton's style, uh, his whole way of treating the subject, and say something about neoclassicism. 
which is a term that's used to cover the mainstream style of about 1760 to 1800, give or take a decade or so. It's a kind of sloppy term, partly aesthetic, partly moral and political, often overlapping. That overlap of aesthetic and moral and political can have an exciting result um, <coughs> in history painting in particular. For example, in this painting you all know, painted 17 years later in Rome by Jacques-Louis David, which has become a kind of poster image for the French Revolution. Even though it was painted in Rome for the King of France, and it didn't have subversive intentions at all. It was only later, after the Revolution, that revolutionaries saw themselves in it as brothers uh, united in their resolve to fight no matter what happened. <coughs> and David certainly knew Hamilton's death of Lucretia, possibly in the original, certainly in the engraving that you've seen. And here he adopted it <coughs> freely for an earlier episode in Livy's history. Two centuries before the story of Lucretia and Brutus, <coughs> there was a feud between Rome and Alba Longa. And Livy says that since each tribe had a set of male triplets, they decided to settle the dispute by single combat, actually triple combat, David shows a scene that's not in Livy. David actually dreamt this up. <coughs> and before the battle, the three young Horatii representing Rome swore, swore an oath, just like Hamilton's trio. The women and children show the fear and sorrow that was thought to be natural to their gender and age. The men, by contrast, are taught in every muscle with the sheer force of their wills. In David's huge picture, the intervals between the figures uh, are greater. The surrounding space seems to reverberate. The setting is clearer than in Hamilton's picture and just as austere. But the derivation, I think, is still pretty clear. Artists in the 1760s didn't use the word neoclassical. That was dreamt up about a century later. But they were aware of the newness of what they were doing relative to the painting of the so-called Rococo period that they brought to a rapid end. Their work was a revival, as they saw it, a renaissance. Their name for it was the true style. Their idea was to return to fundamentals, take art back to basics. Well, this is a familiar refrain that you recognize from the Protestant Reformation and practically every other reform of churches and political bodies. Reformers always claim to be getting rid of the superfluous and the corrupt, the amoral and the unserious, and to be leading the faithful back to the truest and simplest and best that there once was. In my title for this lecture, I quote an ideal for history painting defined by Denis Diderot to paint the way the Spartans spoke. Ever since Plato, people of ancient Sparta were known for being terse, to the point, laconic. In fact, the word laconic means from Laconia, and Laconia is another name for Sparta. Diderot reviewed the annual Salon exhibitions in Paris for 20 years during this period, and he was announcing that the wind was shifting. Paint only what counts, in other words. Pare it down to the essentials. Painters in France had done everything but that during the previous half century, the era of the style that got the mocking name Rococo. In France, uh, Watteau's reception piece for the Academy as a history painting, painter was set in the classical world, all right, but on Cythera, on an island dedicated to Venus. And it's not about eternal virtue, but about the fleeting joys of love. Watteau satisfies what Voltaire described as taste, as follows. Taste for Voltaire was a quick discernment, a sudden perception, which, like the sensations of the palate, anticipates reflection. Like the palate, it reflect, re relishes what is good with an exquisite and voluptuous sensibility and rejects the contrary with loathing and disgust. Well, even when the subject was the Old Testament, 
there is still pleasure and excitement uh, in Fragonard here, uh, still a, what Voltaire called a, a voluptuous sensibility. This is the painting that Fragonard, uh, for which he got the chance to study in Rome with Hamilton's own teacher, Mazzucci. The proud king, Jeroboam, learns from a, a prophet that his altar is going to be destroyed and he tries to arrest the prophet, whereupon the altar crumbles and the king's hand withers. The staging is wildly elaborate, the action is agitated, and there's a flavor of caricature to the extravagant costumes and gesturing figures. This is what Mazzucci had to teach. A skilled, conservative reenactment re <coughs> of a mi recent miracle in an idealized setting with participants who are lightweight, well-dressed, and well-behaved. This was recent history, but Mazzucci could have given you Greek or Roman, if you, if you wished. His main competitor in Rome was Pompeo Batoni, a real celebrity and a more exciting artist. He was famous for portraits, as you've seen, but he also painted subjects from the Bible and mythology with gorgeous color and a great deal to look at. Uh, this story is from Iphigenia in Aulis by Euripides, the climax of the play when the god Artemis has told Agamemnon to sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia, in order for the Greeks to have a fair wind to go uh, to Troy. It's a kind of prequel to the Iliad in Hollywood terms. She, she offers herself, and he's just about to do the deed, the moral of the story here is something like Lucretia's, a self-sacrificing woman makes it possible for the men to succeed in their great enterprise. Within 20 years, tastes in Rome have begun to change. This is the fresco by Mengs on the ceiling of the brand new villa on the Villa Via Salaria, built for Cardinal Alessandro Albani, who was a great collector of antiquities and a supporter of Winkelmann. For the Cardinal, uh, this painting uh, of Parnassus uh, must have been a kind of statement of faith, not faith in the church, but in the eternal virtue and beauty of the ancients, the pagan gods grouped around Apollo. The figures are still relatively slender and light, it's true, but they are composed with a kind of calm symmetry and measured intervals. This was a mild preview uh, of what was coming very soon which was the full force of Hamilton's new Iliad pictures and the Lucretia, weighty and aflame with moral fervor. These compositions traveled in reproduction, as we've been seeing, and their influence was felt very quickly. Uh, Hamilton's Lucretia obviously encouraged this little-known French painter, uh, Beaufort, uh, to give the subject a try. He takes over the layout and some of the poses, but the colors are still bright, and the figures slender, and the setting, setting is sumptuous, full of carpets and drapery and swanky furniture. When he revised this sketch into a full-scale work for the Salon, Beaufort turned, toned it way down. He made it more fashionably serious by subduing the color and focusing the light and making a single a stage, stage space that's shallower and more austere. The print has a caption that emphasizes not Lucretia, but as you see, Brutus. And it's the men's oath-taking here that provided a handy image of political solidarity for several European revolutions. This was the oath, of course, that drove out the tyrant king and launched the Roman Republic. And so, with a few changes of costume, it served other artists, for example, the painter Fusli, the Swiss painter on the left, served him for an emblem of Swiss unity, the medieval confederation of the cantons that was supposedly formed by an oath sworn on a meadow near Lucerne. And again, on the right by David, several years after the oath of the Horatii, an actual oath by deputies to a national assembly proclaiming that they and not the king were the ultimate power. The young American, uh, John Trumbull, on the left, who'd served briefly in the militia during the American Revolution, 
was working in 1777 in Boston, teaching himself to become a history painter, used the engraving um, by Hamilton after Hamilton for his own version uh, of the scene. It lacks uh, Hamilton's sort of stern energy, but I think its subject, uh, sacrifice, it resolve, may well have been intended uh, for American, a model, say, for American patriotism and the will to liberty. I want to finish by returning to several questions. Uh, first of all, why this Roman subject painted by an emigre Scot and painted um, and bought by a Scottish buyer? This was a time uh, when educated British and Scottish people thought a great deal about Roman virtues and Roman models as they applied, <coughs> as these might apply to uh, their own monarchy and parliament. There had been vast changes since 1700. The king's power had been very severely limited by the Bill of Rights, and the shift of political weight to a cabinet and a parliament in which the great landowners, the rich traders, and the bankers were dominant. It had been a kind of bloodless revolution, and it caused those on the left and the broad middle, what, what we today would call progressives, to believe that they themselves were actually realizing, succeeding in realizing the political ideals of their Roman predecessors, who had been inspired by the memory of the founders that Hamilton painted. The houses these people built were now apt to look Roman, like Lord Burlington's villa and garden buildings at Chiswick, full of statues of eminent Romans. They advertised Burlington's enlightened politics with Roman temple fronts, a rotunda, windows from Roman baths, as brought up to date by Andrea Palladio during the late Renaissance. Burlington's villa and soon dozens of others in England and Scotland embodied all that was great, both ancient and modern. What can we say about the moral of the picture? Well, from our viewpoint, um, we have here the classic case of blame the victim. Now, Livy doesn't question the moral code that caused Lucretia, who was raped, to blame herself for bringing dishonor to her family and killing herself in order to restore that honor. The men saw that injustice, though. You heard Livy say that before she died, the men, and I'm quoting again, tried to console her by turning the guilt from the victim of the outrage to the perpetrator, urging that where there has been no consent, there is no guilt. And she says, Although I acquit myself from sin, I do not free myself from penalty. Her last words are, No ch unchaste woman shall thenceforth live and plead Lucretia's example. She dies, in other words, so that she'll be an example to women who really do sin. To them, she says, in effect, do the honorable thing as I did. Well, to us, this seems like an impossibly high-minded act or on a grossly unjust premise. It's a kind of honor killing, but committed by the victim herself. I use the term honor killing because it's in the news a lot these days. It's survived honor killing for millennia into our own time. It seems to occur in many different cultures and religious conditions. It's often rooted not just in conceptions of honor, but also property rights. The idea that a woman's purity has value to her family, and to lose it, let alone squander it, is a deep offense that must be punished in order to maintain social order. In any case, Livy's Roman readers would have understood the story differently. In a family, they believed, the father is the law. And Livy gives another example, uh, an event 50 years after Lucretia, when the Republic had declined into an oligarchy ruled by a council of ten, and, was, and it was restored by the case of Virginia. 
I'm showing you an engraving after a lost painting by English contemporary of Hamilton, a man he knew, in Rome, uh, Nathaniel Dance. Virginia was a Roman schoolgirl, uh, engaged to be married, who was accused of being a slave by a henchman of the corrupt leader of the council, who wanted Virginia for himself. The case was brought to court, but the case wasn't going well, and so her father stabbed her to death, saying that this was the only way to ensure her freedom. The injustice of the death led to the defeat of the Council of Ten and the restoration of the Senate and the Republic. Today, um, Hamilton's picture language um, may strike us as exaggerated. Um, Brutus may be overacting, the figures may be a bit clumsy, the expressions forced, and the composition crowded and claustrophobic. But there's no doubt how skillful all of this is at getting the message across. In the case of Lucretia, it's a message of self-sacrifice for the sake of honor. And in Lucretia's last act is to reach for Brutus. That line of her arm, beginning with her husband, connecting uh, to Brutus, that line connects them graphically and emphasizes that she's transmitting to Brutus an obligation. It comes to a climax of the upflung arm. An obligation to avenge her for the crime that was committed by the rapist prince and to avenge Rome as well, which was suffering under the tyrant king. So here the private becomes public as the men accept their obligation and they swear to meet it. Doing so has huge consequences for the citizens of the state, consequences greater than from anyone here in this picture, and consequences for history. After Gavin Hamilton painted another scene in 1767 uh, of a heroic Roman matron, this one of the widow Agrippina landing in Italy with the ashes of her husband, the young American traveler Benjamin West saw it in some version or other when he went to Hamilton's studio because it inspired a picture by West of the same rare subject that's now at Yale. But that's the subject of our next lecture. So please come if you can. Thank you.